Hi, everybody. My name is Allie Himes, and I am going to be your host today. Um, before we get started, though, I want to let everybody know um, that the information that's going to be provided during this event is going to be for educational purposes only. It's not intended, nor is it implied to be a substitute for professional medical advice. Always consult your healthcare provider to determine the appropriateness of the information for your own situation. And if you have any questions regarding medical conditions or treatment plans, please consult your physician. Participating in this event with your clinician does not create, with a clinician, excuse me, does not create a physician-patient relationship. And with that, we'll go ahead and begin. Uh, participating with me today is uh, Dr. Rich Davis. He is our, I'd want to get your title correct, uh, is our Clinical Microbiology Lab Director at Providence Sacred Heart Medical Center in Spokane, Washington, also somewhat of an internet celebrity, but we'll get to that a little bit later. <laughs> uh, so Dr. Davis, just to start off, can you let us know what your role is with Providence? Sure, so as you mentioned, I'm the director of the Clinical Microbiology Laboratory and Infectious Disease Testing here in Spokane, Washington, and for PHC in general. So I serve as the um, technical director, so in charge of the scientific and technical affairs of the infectious disease testing uh, platforms that we do, and also kind of to serve as the liaison between clinical staff. I'm not a, I don't treat patients, I'm strictly in the laboratory, but yeah, it's kind of my role. And so um, today we're gonna be talking about uh, a demonstration that you did that was, you know, very simple, it showed um, the effect effectiveness of masks uh, using petri dishes. Right. So to set the stage for the rest of our conversation, let's just ask a very basic question. What are masks designed to do? Sure. So kind of logically, a, a face mask is just anything or a face covering is just something that's going to prevent, um, you can think of it as two ways, right? It's something that's going to prevent stuff from leaving you and something that's gonna prevent you, in, uh, depending on the mask type, from breathing something in. So, you know, you see during um, fire uh, wildfires, uh, firefighters wear specific type of respirators that help them not breathe in uh, particles and make sure that they have enough oxygen. And the kind of face coverings we're talking about are um, sort of hospital grade uh, surgical masks or like a handmade uh, face covering uh, made out of just cloth, hand sewn, something like that. Um, something that you would wear over your face to prevent you from sharing uh, respiratory droplets and other respiratory secretions with other people. So I think in the current day and age, I think everyone in the world is probably more aware of face masks than they ever were before, but that's kind of what we're talking about today. And so you did this demonstration to show the effectiveness of masking um, using a Petri dish to make this invisible threat, if you will, visible, right? Um, and it just absolutely took off. I mean, it's, I've, I keep seeing the, the photos of the Petri dishes going around social media. Um, it definitely went on news outlets across the country and then um, now across the world. What prompted you to conduct this demonstration? Sure. Well, this was a really, um, I, in a lot of ways, simple ask. Um, as um, many healthcare systems, Providence has been using um, a mandatory mask requirement for caregivers within uh, the hospitals and, and facilities. And I think just in order to help cement the, the importance of uh, proper mask wearing, uh, Peg Curry, who is our uh, operational uh, administrator for PHC, just uh, sent a message down like, hey, can anyone, is there something that we could do to try to show the value of this? So, um, yeah, I think maybe instead of just talking obliquely about it, uh, why don't we go ahead and just bring up the first, you know, kind of visual of what I actually did to kind of describe that. So this was uh, the, the gist of this, and I, I appreciate that you call it a demonstration because this was not um, anything new, nor was this an exhaust, exhaustive experiment. All I did is I um, did different behaviors, um, coughing, talking, singing, or sneezing with or without a mask. So these Petri dishes that you mentioned that you see here, these are bacteria culture plates. 
And we know that, you know, coronavirus and flu virus, you know, viruses are not bacteria and you don't grow them on a bacterial culture plate like this. But the demonstration here, the, the really the, the goal was to show that, you know, like everybody, I have bacteria that live <clears throat> normally and not hurting me inside my mouth and my throat. And by doing these behaviors, coughing, talking, sneezing, et cetera, those uh, bacteria can be transmitted outward um, in droplet form in these small particles. So by using the bacteria culture plate and, uh, and making that kind of like the landing place of these droplets and then letting those plates grow for 24 hours, it really shows these uh, colonies of bacteria that demonstrate uh, kind of where the droplets went. So I think it's, and I try to be super clear in, in all possible ways, this is not showing coronavirus, which I uh, don't have, and it's not how you would grow viruses anyway. But the goal here was just to demonstrate where droplets go using bacteria to show uh, basically as a proxy where droplets end up. So I did this mask versus no mask experiment with these different behaviors, coughing, talking, singing, sneezing. and. And despite the really uh, dramatic coughing and sneezing, I think it's important to note that just talking and just singing uh, does make a difference uh, when you wear a mask. So if we could go to the next one, the other part, the next slide, the uh, other part of this demonstration was a kind of social distancing approach. So what I did is I set these uh, bacteria culture plates two, four and six feet away from me and I coughed um, for about 15 seconds. Uh, facing in the direction of where I put the plates. And it just goes to show that, you know, when um, you're coughing, those large respiratory droplets that come out of your mouth, um, those are big and heavy and they're going to be affected by gravity. And a lot of them are going to fall out of suspension, fall out of the air within six feet. But by wearing a mask, um, with like, I think one tiny exception, if you look really close at the two foot mask plate over on the left side there, there's one tiny bacteria colony. Uh, it really just goes to show that there's a dramatic difference in the ability of a mask to block respiratory droplets that come out of your mouth. Um, and that uh, the six feet rule that we've been talking about and hearing about, it's not a force field that's gonna prevent any sort of aerosol or droplet that comes out of your mouth from traveling that far. But keeping your distance of six feet really is gonna make a difference in uh, droplets that might be spread by somebody um, around you. Um, Dr. Davis, I wanna go back to the, um, the behavior parts. Because sure. I understand, I understand why you would wanna test this out with talking and with coughing, because that's something that we hear often, but why did you also include singing? Sure. Well, you know, I could have done, um, I could have done uh, laughing. I could have done burping. Somebody on social media asked if I could do that. But these behaviors are really common ones, um, specifically singing. And if you don't mind, if we could go back to the other slide, just so people can be looking at it while we're talking about it. Singing, um, one of the first major uh, investigated outbreaks of SARS-CoV-2 in the United States and here in Washington, in fact, was associated with a choir practice. So people um, who didn't know that they were sick went to this, or maybe who were showing really mild symptoms, still attended a choir practice. And in that setting, when you are really singing, and I'm not a trained singer, uh, and I only sang for like 60 seconds, and who sings alone in a room for 60 seconds? <laughs> uh, you know, so, so this, this outbreak was really unfortunate. A lot of people got sick, and there were, there were at least two deaths associated with that choir outbreak. From a personal standpoint, uh, my mom actually, she uh, helps uh, manage and run a choir and orchestra in my hometown. And just the thought of including singing on there just made a lot of sense with what we know about something that is going to generate a lot of um, droplets. People are breathing deep. If you ever see, you know, someone singing at a microphone on a, on a bright stage light, you know, you know that that uh, droplets are, are produced by that kind of behavior. So that's kind of the rationale for including singing on there. Um, I you know, and I, I also want to go back to when you were saying, thanks for calling this a demonstration um, versus an experiment, which is what I had been calling it. Uh, gosh, since you did, since you did this demonstration, what's sure. the difference between a demonstration and an experiment? Right. Well, I mean, I guess it just, and, and it's, it might be a little nitpicky, um, frankly, 
But the, the gist is that this is, um, this is not new information. Uh, in fact, I, I didn't really notice at the time, but after this kind of started to spread around, somebody shared with me um, a news article back from 1912 during the, the or 1918, the, the Spanish flu outbreak that you know killed um, so many people worldwide. And in fact, this same exact setup of, 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 of that I did was done by someone at Harvard. Basically, they took bacteria culture dishes and put them in their big lecture hall at these different places. And then they talked really loudly or they talked normally or they sneezed to see how far the bacteria could be found afterwards. So I, by not calling it an experiment, what this is not something that I would um, try to publish in a in a journal. This this was just me um, on an afternoon when I came into the lab to do this, because we're not trying to really probe the limits of a mask. We're not trying to demonstrate all the ways that a mask could or could not fail, or which mask type would be preferable. Uh, really. Uh, if we wanted to do something like that, we would use a lot more people. We would use a lot more tight controls. We would um, do this very differently. And um, so I, I don't want anyone to think that by doing this and sharing these images, we're trying to make conclusive claims about a mask will be effective against everything all the time in every scenario. That's really not the case. We're seeing bacteria growing on a culture plate that demonstrates where respiratory droplets traveled. Um, there are a lot more sophisticated methods you can use to see where exhalations come from your nose, from the side of a mask. There's really good data out there. Um, and I don't know if it would be possible to share some of these uh, resources, but there's data showing you know, which mask type, a, um, a triple layer surgical mask you'd get in the hospital, a handmade fabric mask, an N95 respirator, et cetera, um, what those would do to block aerosol, uh, you know, uh, exhalations coming out of your mouth. This was not the point of that. Um, it was kind of just using common sense um, readouts to show exactly what a mask can do um, to do the things that we know that masks are supposed to do, which is block respiratory droplets. Um, I just will say one thing also, since uh, I haven't mentioned it thus far, but Face shields are another thing that people are very curious about. And face shields play, I think, a really important role. Um, you know, when we talk about uh, mask usage, and I've, as I've tried to highlight, we're really talking about blocking stuff that's coming out of you that's going to be, you know, trapped or, or prevented here from going out into your environment. And face shields, I think, also can serve that purpose of if you have a clear plastic covering over your face, it's going to block droplets from coming uh, away from you into the environment. And obviously there will be space on the side and below and, and it doesn't cut off your, it's not a scuba mask, but a, 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 a plate should, a, a face mask like that should drop, prevent droplets from going out. And I think that they serve the additional benefit of blocking things that would uh, come at you and like hit you in a place not covered by a mask. Something, we know that eyes are another, um, mucosal surfaces on your face are potential areas that droplets could hit you. Um, a lot of really, really smart uh, infectious disease folks um, are, have, have shown uh, or have um, used their expertise to, to uh, suggest the use of clear plastic face shields for all uh, caregivers, people who interact with patients. And there's probably uh, in, in a, in a you could envision a scenario where people, instead of wearing masks all the time, went out with clear plastic face shields. People who read lips, people who um, might be treated differently because they were wearing a face mask. You know, a face shield might be an option for that. But I just wanted to make that point about face shields since it didn't wasn't something I specifically tested in this little demonstration. Um, Dr. Davis, we got a we got a question in from social media, and um, if you're not the right person to to answer this, uh, free field to tell us. Um, but we had a commenter asked, why were we asked to wear a mask for COVID, but not for TB? Sure, um, I can, I think I can speak to that. So TB, uh, tuberculosis, it's caused by a, a bacteria called Mycobacterium tuberculosis. And if you think about the way diseases spread and disease prevalence, I think that really is the, the biggest rationale. Um, we know that, well, 
we know a lot more about COVID-19 now than we did when this first uh, reared its head back in late uh, 2019. But uh, seeing the way that respiratory viruses can spread person to person and under what conditions and how prevalent it is in a population, all of those kind of considerations play into, I think, guidelines that should be followed by um, the people who will be most, most affected. So talking about COVID-19, we are in a situation where it's prevalent in our communities. It's, um, it is, you're not going to have symptoms for a while, so not, people will be infected and not know it. And in those situations, uh, a very safe process would be to recommend, recommend wide uh, preventative measures like mask wearing, like keeping social distance, like washing your hands, et cetera. If um, a hypothetical infectious disease that's bacterial instead of viral, that was as dangerous and deadly as TB can be and was as infectious as, as uh, say, COVID-19 could be, then certainly a, a universal mask wearing would make sense. But since we talked specifically about TB, in um, a infectious disease laboratory like ours, um, when you are going to be culturing, growing, working with um, specimens that have a high probability of having tuberculosis in them, then we absolutely do wear masks. We wear uh, very specific masks and work in dedicated biosafety cabinets to prevent any accidental exposure or inhalation of that infectious organism. So uh, it's kind of so I think the biggest takeaway, it's all about prevalence and about how infectious and dangerous something could be. And I think that the, the difference is in how prevalent infectious uh, any given person would be with TB or with COVID is the is is kind of the, the reason why we, we're not all wearing. We have not to this date been wearing masks all the time, 100 percent of the time to prevent every possible respiratory infection. And now in your, um, in your demonstration, you used a hospital grade mask. Um, not everybody has access or has those. Some are using cloth masks from home. Do you have um, an opinion about the effectiveness between those two? Well, I think the first thing I'd wanna say is that for this demonstration, for the, the kind of readout that we were trying, I was doing, I did not, test every type of mask, nor would I expect those bacteria culture plates to look different um, based on the mask type that I used. And in fact, uh, a colleague from Texas kind of did the same exact thing using a cloth mask, a, a surgical grade, a hospital grade surgical mask, and an N95 mask. And as expected, the, the bacteria culture plates looked the, precisely the same. Uh, that was Dr. Uh, Rodney Rhodes. And um, but I think so. So in terms of what I did and what we're what the plates would look like, no, we would expect a, any mask to be able to catch the big droplets that would prevent the bacteria from a mouth from getting on the plate. So really, the real question is what masks are going to be effective at blocking coronavirus? That's the thing we care about. That's why we're talking about this at all. Right. And I, I, I want to make it really clear. A virus is very different than a bacteria. It's it's orders of magnitude smaller, um, but a virus doesn't travel by itself in the air. A virus that comes out of a person is enclosed in a respiratory particle. So for coronavirus and most of your respiratory upper respiratory tract viruses or lower respiratory tract viruses, those are contained in large fat wet droplets. And a droplet of that size is going to be caught and blocked by um, a lot of different types of materials. It's going to be got, caught by um, a surgical mask, a fabric mask. If I had just held like a, a Kleenex or a paper towel over my mouth and coughed in it, you know, it was, it's going to get wet and moist over time. And that would show that, hey, you know, there is uh, respiratory particles that are being caught here. So I think definitely the, to, to prevent uh, virus transmission, something that is worn over your mouth and worn appropriately, to that I mean, and I'll just demonstrate and hopefully you'll be able to hear me still, I think you will, but something that is not necessarily like airtight to your face, but is fitted around your nose, something that is not excessively loose on the sides, something that you don't wear with your, mat, with your nose showing because your, your nose is going to exhale at high velocity, you know, potential respiratory particles, 
someone who doesn't wear it under their chin and potentially, you know, kind of make their chin and their face be covered with what they exhaled into this. Mm -hmm. um, those are the types of behaviors and those are the type of masks that are going to really make a difference. And I already kind of talked about the um, face shields, but um, yeah, I guess that'd be my answer to that. So what can you say to the people who claim that wearing a mask can be harmful? Well, I think we already knew that that was not the case. We know that um, surgeons who wear masks uh, during, you know, five, 10 hour uh, operations are not passing out from hypoxia. Um, mm. So, but now we've got scenarios where healthcare um, associations and systems around the country have caregivers wearing masks all the time and they're not um, passing out from lack of oxygen and they're not getting increased respiratory infections. Um, I, a number of people, I think may, when they saw those really kind of dramatic images that I, I created, they said, oh my gosh, this just shows how disgusting <laughs> your mouth <laughs> is. And you're saying that you want to breathe in all of that disgusting bacteria. Well, first of all, you are already, you have every, every person has bacteria and there's nothing to suggest that you breathe something out to, to eliminate like an infection and that if you accumulate it in, in front of your mouth and then breathe it back in, somehow that's infecting you when you weren't infected before. It just logically doesn't make a lot of sense. And, and to the second, to the other part of like someone seeing these bacteria plates and saying, oh, how gross, how disgusting. You wouldn't, why would you wanna breathe that in instead of just getting it out of your body? Well, we, I, I, I coughed and sneezed and talked onto plates designed to grow detect large, large amounts of bacteria. This was like candy for bacteria. bacteria they, they went bonanza. They grew out of control on these plates, right? So that the inside of your lungs and respiratory tract does not look anything like those plates that I just, that I showed. Uh, and in normal circumstances, bacteria do not grow to that extent. So the, I, I, I think that people are, um, there's a lot of information and unfortunately a lot of misinformation out there about mask usage, but there's no evidence that any mask type uh, is going to result in some of the really dire outcomes that some people are claiming masks might have. Um, we have another question from Facebook. Um, so if you look at your note about aerosolized droplets, has there been any more information about SARS, COVID being uh, aerosolized? Also, does a surgical mask do anything to protect you or others from those aerosolized droplets? Sure. So this, I mean, I, I don't, I think that we could talk a lot about this. So I, I'll, I'll, I promise I'll try to be brief, but it is a big conversation. There's been, even just this last week, a lot of uh, discussion about aerosol versus droplet, right? Um, from a uh, general understanding, an aerosol is something that's in the air, right? But when we talk about um, uh, an infection that's transmitted via aerosols or that is airborne, um, that means something really specific. Um, measles is a virus that is transmitted just by, you know, breathing out. Just it, it, it can attach itself onto things that you breathe out that are so small they can travel extremely large distances. And um, we know that the uh, number of people who can be infected by one single person infected by measles is very high. The that rate is like one infectious person can infect 10 to 14 other people uh, with measles. With coronavirus, we know that the infectious rate is, is a lot lower than that. And so while there is very there is evidence showing that um, it's a spectrum, right, where even if most particles, uh, even most coronavirus is transmitted by big fat particles, I'm sure there's gonna be, there's going to be smaller than that um, aerosols that do have uh, coronavirus in them that it can be transmitted further than that. That's, it, it's always been a spectrum and it's never been, I think, a, a clear, it's only this and never this. But really the important thing, and this is kind of paraphrasing um, a, a really world famous coronavirus, coronavirus expert, it's about, it's not just about what can happen, it's about what's primarily happening. And the mm -hmm. best evidence that we have from an experimental standpoint, people looking at, you know, droplets and things that are created by, you know, coughs and sneeze and coughing, et cetera, and more importantly, the best epidemiological epidemiological data, the data looking at what, how actually this disease is spreading, really suggests that the primary driver of respiratory transmission of coronavirus 
is by spreading large droplets, the kinds that we expect will, will be blocked in large degree by wearing a mask. Uh, the last part of the question was about what kind of protection is offered to a person uh, from uh, by uh, uh, this type of mask. Was that, is that more or less correct? Like well, how, how am I protected by wearing a mask? Um, we think that there's, you know, definitely something that is like a, an N95 respirator, something that is going to uh, provide your own air supply system, like a, a PAP or PAPR, something that's used in a hospital. You know, that is going to be a lot more effective at protecting you, a person wearing a mask, than uh, a surgical mask. But I, even if we don't have conclusive evidence so far as to how a mask can protect you, I think it's pretty logical that you could expect some degree of protection by wearing a mask. But I think the biggest, biggest take home and the reason why I think everyone should be um, encouraging mask use is that if we are all wearing masks, whether you're symptomatic, whether you're sick, whether you're immune suppressed, whether you're healthy, generally, um, that is going to prevent the people who have infection and not know it from preventing, again, via those big fat respiratory droplets, preventing that uh, from spreading it to other people. We have probably time for one more Facebook question. Um, actually, this is from LinkedIn. Um, does effectiveness diminish over time? For example, how long should we be wearing one mask before changing it out? Um, the person who's commenting says, our facility assumes we should use the same mask all day long as long as it's not visibly soiled? Uh, I think that's a little bit outside of what I feel comfortable you know, speaking to. Um, <laughs> certainly, I think whatever your um, guidelines you've received about appropriate mask usage, uh, you should definitely try to follow those to the best of your ability. But I don't think that that's uh, in my uh, wheelhouse to, to speak to that specific question. And that's fair. I have one more question for you. Um, to put a pretty bu pretty bow and wrap this all up, um, what was your takeaway from the demonstration? You know, um, <laughs> it was I, I'm it was definitely fun to do. Uh, like I said, this is not groundbreaking science to do, but you know, when I came in the next day after coming in just one casual weekend afternoon, which is really what it was. And when I came in that next day and opened the incubator, um, there really was a moment of like, yeah, like this really matters. This sort of simple thing, even though I've got plenty of expertise in microbiology, there really is, I think, a visceral reaction to seeing something that is so dramatically different between mask wearing, not mask wearing two feet away versus six feet away that really kind of just brought it home that all of these things that we've been recommending and saying all along, it's not made up. It's not, um, it, it, even though we don't have all the answers, we had enough uh, early on in this whole pandemic to know that these were smart and good things that we should be doing. And hopefully it only helps drive home that it definitely is something that we should all try to adhere to the best we can. Uh, anything else you want to add? Um, you know, uh, if you have a cloth mask, uh, be sure you launder it re uh, frequently. Don't pull it off your face, get it all over your hands and tuck it in your pocket. Hand washing, um, uh, uh, being smart about who you're around and how often, um, all those things really can make a difference. And so just uh, to the best of your ability, keep sh sharing the message and keep encouraging people to do what they can. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Davis, for joining with us today and to for answering questions from Facebook and from LinkedIn. Um, Absolutely. If, uh, anyone who's listening out there, if you're looking for medical advice, please visit it, providence.org and make sure to follow us on our social media channels. We're on um, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. You can just search for Providence or Providence Health System. And one last note before uh, we go, Please use the follow the hashtag and use the hashtag work your mask on social media. And if you're inspired, share a picture of yourself and together we can flatten the curve. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thanks everyone.